What's going on everybody? This is Chip Walton. Welcome to Chop and Brew as we continue our celebration of Mead Month with our ongoing Better Judge a Mead interview series. BJM for short. Before we get into this week's episode, I want to quickly tell y'all that last weekend I was lucky enough to meet up with BJM guest host Josh Holbrook and our buddy Steve Fletty and go deep into a flight of single variety traditional mead that the two of them had made. It was a fascinating journey through the flavors of some very unique honeys. We were also blessed with a trio of authentic Polish meads Josh brought. Polish meads are all the rage right now and I never had one so it was huge to get to taste these actual professional Polish examples alongside these two mead masters. We rolled video on the whole thing, and I hope to get something edited from both sessions at some point soon. However, the focus of this video is Josh's recent conversation with Tom Repass. Tom has a long list of achievements on his Mead resume, including two-time Best of Show winner at Mazer Cup, winner of AMMA National Mead Maker of the Year, and the group's Ken Schramm Award. Plus, he's the owner of and master beekeeper at Canyon Rim honeybees in South Dakota, so he clearly knows a lot about honey and its fermentation. And they talk a lot about mead and mead judging. Topics including rising above personal preference when judging, novelty bias and bias towards intense flavors, what to look for when judging Polish meads, the trouble with judges championing a mead at competition, advice for intermediate judges, and much, much more. As part of their discussion, they taste together and give judging notes on a mead called Mera Ume from Zen B. It's a 6.5 ABV session mead with plums and maraschino cherries. A quick note to the BJCP folks out there, watching and giving feedback on these uh, BJAM interviews can actually land you some epic non-judging points. So check out the link in the video description below to make that happen. Next week on Better Judge or Mead, Carvin Wilson the honey dragon carvin is an award-winning mead maker including mead maker of the year for both amma and aha he's a member of the aha governing committee one of the founding members of the mead institute and home competition organizer for mazer cup plus the man has the most epic stockpile of honeys from all around the world that conversation promises to go hard on the mead nerdery before we get going, shout out to our ongoing sponsor, Imperial Yeast, now shipping from both the East and West Coast. Check them out, imperialyeast.com, and the Patreon party people. They are the hive that keeps the honey flowing at Chop and Brew. Join them at supporting the show at patreon.com slash chop and brew. All right, Tom, thanks for being with me today. We're going to work through our discussion of some of these judging topics. Excellent. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. So when it comes to me judging, a lot of times the term that gets thrown around is balance. Because uh, when we're talking about meads that, that don't have a really a lot of obvious flaws or, or blemishes, uh, a lot of the the judging comes down to how well is it in balance or not. Can you speak to how does a judge recognize when a mead is in balance versus out of balance? So, well, that's a very good question. And I think that word or that description is going to mean different things to different people. Um, you know, let's just talking about like sweet and acid, you know, we often use those to play around to try to balance each other, but you're not going to have it completely, you know, 50, 50 or completely equal necessarily. Um, what I mean is sometimes you might want something a little bit more towards the sweet side. And if that's what you're aiming for and it's pleasant and it's not, you know, overly syrupy or cloying, then, then that's a balanced meat, even though it's tends to be more towards the sweet side. On the other hand, on the other hand, you might want something a little bit more towards the acid side, maybe something that's a little bit crisp to clean your palate. Um, you know, maybe somebody will carbonate it, you know, and so the sweetness will be in the background. And so it's a little bit more acid forward, a little bit um, lighter, and that might be something that you're aiming for. So it's not exactly equally weighted. I mean, if you did that, if, if there was a way to even do that, I mean, you'd have this sweet and sour thing going on, and they'd be kind of fighting each other. So balance is not necessarily weighted equally, it depends, uh, you know, what you're aiming for. And honestly, sometimes, 
you know, as a, as a competitor, I will put something a little bit out of balance to make it interesting, but not enough to make it unpleasant. Um, you know, maybe I'll, uh, it, it depends what I'm making, but maybe I'll have a little bit of tannins there just to, to dry it out, but not to make it so that it's, you know, overly astringent and unpleasant. So balance, um, you know, it's going to be different things to different people, but also depending on the beverage that I'm, I'm making, uh, it'll be different as well. So when we're considering things that may not exactly have an ease, uh, even expression, say like maybe there's a higher sweetness than other examples, how does a judge separate out their own preference for if they prefer something sweeter versus if it's it's drier and it's, how do they separate out their personal preference from how they, uh, they you know, assert that balance or if it is a balance? So that's going to be very difficult. You know, we are, are beings that live within our senses, you know, what we sense and what we perceive. And, and beyond that, it's going to be whatever experiences we've had in our life. And I mean, just as an example, you know, most people, the first time they, they try a, an IPA or they try black coffee, you know, they don't like it. You know, usually it's not until you sort of build a, a, a taste for those type of things, you know, using bitter as an example. Um, so some one person might say, well, that's great. You know, another person's like, oh, that's way too bitter. I don't like it. And so as judges, you know, we try to rise above, you know, our own personal preferences if we can. And, and the way to do that is to identify them too. You know, there's certain things that you don't like. Um, maybe you shouldn't be judging that. You know, if, if you're in a, in a um, you, you might request to judge a different category, but if, you, you know, there's not enough judges, you know, you need to rise above that. If somebody doesn't like IPAs, but they're judging them, they need to take away that personal, I don't like this. And, and look at it for what it is. Um, that's what I try to do. I try to look at what's in the glass and judge what's in front of me. Um, does it fit the category? I mean, obviously if somebody entered something, uh, you know, very sweet into the dry category. I mean, that's, that's a problem. But if it's a little bit, you know, let's say it's maybe edging towards the off dry or maybe the low semi-sweet, you know, that's, that's gonna have to be a judgment call as a judge, you know, is that out of category or is it too much? And Different people will have different opinions on that. Um, that's why we, you know, entries are usually judged by more than one judge so that you can get more than one, um, one person's uh, opinion about it. I suppose this is, it's still a very subjective thing that we're talking about, but the hope is that that subjectivity is maybe tempered by experience, having had a lot of different examples and recognizing exactly. what separates, you know, good from bad or, or. Exactly, exactly. And that's probably the most important thing is for folks that are, uh, you know, starting to judge, or even if they've been judging for a while, but maybe they haven't judged mead, uh, you know, you really need to have um, experience for, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly. I mean, some, some, uh, you don't want to just be chase, tasting the good stuff. And the other thing is you don't want to be just tasting your own stuff only, or like your favorite meadery only, and not, you know, broaden your experience. You need to try a lot of different kinds of mead. Um, and even meads that maybe are not your, you know, favorite, but that are well-made, you know, just so that you can appreciate them for what they are, even that might, even if it might not be something that you might re reach for, you know, for your own enjoyment. Yeah, excellent. Uh, I'm curious your take on, because it seems like people can have an easy bias toward intensity. So just the idea that meads with really intense flavors tend to do well in competitions against meads that are maybe more subtle. So can you offer some advice for judges on how to fairly compare different styles in that regard, really intense versus subtle? That's a really good question. You know, and I struggle with that too, as a mead maker. I, I mean, in, in competitions, almost always um, without exception, subtlety is, is not rewarded. And I think that's very unfortunate. Um, and, and it's very hard too, because you're judging a flight and, you know, maybe there's four, maybe there's six, maybe there's eight entries in that flight. And, um, you know, even though you try your best to not have palate fatigue, it, it is a real thing. Um, and so the more subtle meads, you know, if you tried that, that mead by itself, and that was the only one you were having that day, it might be so outstanding and delicious, but it might disappear, you know, among all these other more intense, more, um, you know, intensely uh, flavored meads. And it's a very difficult thing, but I try to, um, as a judge myself, you know, I, I try to, uh, you know, take a step back, you know, rather than just picking out the, the berry bomb, you know, or whatever, you know, try to step back. If somebody is playing with ingredients that are more subtle and difficult to play with, I might, um, you know, consider that also. Mm -hmm. 
you know, strongly flavored ingredients, it's e easy to make an intense uh, mead, but more, you know, ingredients that are harder to capture, um, you know, those might not be as appreciated in a competition, even though they're, they're wonderfully done. It's probably a very parallel conversation, but I mean, complexity versus simple, like is a complex mead, you know, not necessarily just intense, but is a complex mead with a lot of flavors and nuances, always better than a a simple meat maybe it's it only has one ingredient but maybe it's done really well exactly the thing too is you know you can hide behind when you have a lot of different ingredients you know and strong flavors you can hide behind them but making something um you know this is where the traditional meads come in you know or, or even like a a dry or off dry there's nothing there you're totally naked for you know everybody to taste every flaw that there might be there even if it's a very minimal one um whereas if you have a lot of strong flavors you know you can have some of those things you'll, and you might not pick up on them you mentioned dry and trads. Do you think uh, in, the, in the, the scope of BJCP styles that we're looking at, do you think there's a certain specific style that you think suffers from a lack of judges experience with that style? Um, I would say dry traditionals, definitely. Uh, and then session strengths are getting uh, more recognition now, which is nice, finally. Um, you know, it's like, it's not fair that they were being judged against, you know, a standard or stack strength, you know, that but so they're finally getting some more appreciation but um yeah probably the dry trads or actually dry meads in general and then uh there seems to be a bias for towards sweetness uh you know even some of the dry um meads that i've won with you know i, I did put a little bit of sweetness in there but i hit it with e either acid or carbonation and you know it seems it was a difference between being completely dry versus smooth and you can play with that you know and a dry meat doesn't have to be totally bone dry anyway um, but a lot of the judges, they just won't, uh, you know, appreciate them for what they are, you know, you know, there's just a bias towards, you know, and, and as, as me judges, we should know this, but you know, we're, we're only human, uh, you know, so you, you know, when you're trying to taste the honey, you, you, you automatically want to, you know, taste sweet, even though a dry meat's not going to have sweet, you're just, you're going to be seeking more of the honey aroma. Do you think there's any other styles that, you know, maybe they are, you know, easily accepted by judges, but do you think there's any that judges might approach incorrectly? I know there's a lot of debate around the hybrid styles. So Braggett, Sizer, Piment, you know, uh, how people approach those. Are there any other styles like that, that the way you see judges approach these styles, you would want to kind of do it different? Um, you know, I've seen some of the judges judging Polish meats, not really having ever had a Polish meat. And, you know, there's supposed to be some oxidation there, a good oxidation, you know, not, not bad oxidation, but I think a lot of judges, if they've never actually tried, you know, Polish meads, they don't really know what that is. And they just think it's supposed to be a big sack mead, you know, sweet and highly alcoholic. But, you know, if it doesn't have that, that, that character that you would expect in a Polish mead, it's not really a Polish mead then it's a, it's just a sweet sack mead. I struggle with Polish meads because when I look at and try to find guidance, I mean, I could buy commercial examples, but I'm one, when I'm trying to look and see what aspects should I be expecting in a Polish mead, there's very little guidance out there. I mean, the at least the BJCP style guidelines are are not specific, and I, I have the trouble finding even any other resources that speak to what expected characteristics would be. I mean, would you mind kind of running down if you were sitting at a Polish flight? okay, I should expect these meads to be X, Y, and Z. And if they have too much of this or too little of that, would you mind giving a little bit of your take on Polish? Um, you know, there's the different, and I'm certainly not an expert of Polish meads, um, but, you know, I, I, I didn't know that much about them either until I started going to Mazer Cup and started judging and um, started, ju you know, and, and met all, all the Polish mead makers that we all know. Um, but, you know, it, it's not going to be that, you know, that fresh, crisp, high acid that, you know, that I, that's actually the type of meat I usually tend to make most of the time, although I, I make Polish beads now too. Um, but, you know, it's, it's going to have, um, you know, sweetness and there's going to be some oxidation, kind of like a sherry-like note. It, not, not necessarily, it depends how long it's been aged, um, you know, and all the different styles too, and the strengths, but yeah, it's, I don't know, there's just a, it's, it's hard to explain. It's easier almost to show to somebody, you know, this is a, this is a well done Polish meat, try this. And then the first time somebody tries it, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, you know, where has this been my whole life? Does it have to have certain parameters? Like if I had a standard strength Polish mead, or if I had a semi-sweet Polish mead, are those out of style? Um, 
you know, I don't know. I'm not a Polish meat expert. Um, I have to be honest. I know what I've, I know what I've had and I know what I've tried, but um, you know, I, I, I don't, that's, if, if somebody entered one and I tried one, that would be unexpected, but then I would still judge the meat for what it is. And I wouldn't necessarily punish somebody for doing something like that. I, you know, the, the Polish meat almost needs to be like its whole separate category and not just put into the, you know, um, historical, it's like, you know, the historical has become just Polish meat and then with some Tej in there and that's it. And it's, there's like so many other types of historical meat out there. And, and there's so many types of different types of Polish meat. Yeah. And I, I've heard rumblings that there are going to be some more specific guidelines for Polish meat coming out from the BJCP. Uh, so I maybe don't have to harangue you on that. <laughs> yeah, I would love to. I'd love to read them. You know, and, and um, I'd be very interested to 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 see what they what what come, what they come up with. Sure. So when we're talking about me judging as a whole, are there certain aspects of it that you see as the most lacking in need of improvement? Do you see like familiarity with honey varietals or certain ingredients or ability to judge structure? Like, what elements of me judging that you've seen as a judge or as an entrant do you think need the most improvement? Um, definitely honey varietals. You know, everybody knows orange blossom and tupelo and meadow foam, and they're all wonderful honeys. Um, but if you have like an unusual varietal that someone's not really familiar with, um, I've had those dinged, you know, and, and they were perfect examples. They had, didn't have any flaw and they were, it was, it was just like the, it was what it was in the glass, but, um, the judges that had judged them didn't, were not familiar with that type of honey. So they just didn't really know what to expect. Um, it's like, they almost need to have a little sampler of honey to go with your entry on the side, just so that they, they could actually be familiar with what the honey was. I mean, that, that doesn't happen, but. Um, so I think definitely um, it, it's kind of a challenge because as an entrant, if you come up, if you have a unique honey varietal and it's well-made, a lot of judges love that because they love novel honeys, but if they've never had it and it's too obscure, then they'll punish you for it, even though it's a perfect example of that, you know, honey made into a mead. So it's kind of like, it's, it's, it, but it's a difficult, but, um, but I've had some judges not know, you know, or understand some of the more common, like unusual honeys, like, you know, like Lahua and, and Basswood, you know, and those are, you know, those are fairly common. I mean, they're not, and, and some of the judges didn't understand those. So. Hmm. Yeah. It seems like, cause we had mentioned a bias toward intensity. It seems like there's definitely a bias toward novelty too. I, yes. Yes. So I don't like know. fireweed. Well, that's a, not a very intense honey, but it's a, a very delightful honey. And I've had judges not really, you know, appreciate it. They, you know, they, they wanted a meadow foam or something. Is that something that the, the novelty, is that something we need to fight against to, to make sure that like a more common honey varietal that's really done well by an entrant gets an equal shake? Or is this, uh, do you, is there a concern by that? Well, I, I don't, it, I mean, I would love to be able to counteract, con, you know, counteract that. But I mean, the truth is, you know, as humans, we love the novel. I mean, that's just how people are. You know, what's this new shiny thing? You know, well, what's this new, uh, you know, so they do, we do love novel. It's part of our, our nature. So the best judges, we will realize that um, and then take a step back just because this is something unusual or rare or uncommon. Um, it, we shouldn't give extra points for that. You know, it should be, is this well-made? And if it's, if it's unique and it's well-made, awesome. But if something's a little bit more common and it's, it's made even, you know, it's better made then that one should be the one that, you know, gets the credit. I feel like in these uh, discussions I've had with people, uh, there's an opportunity to have conversations about ethics that are not easy to have with people individually when it comes to judging. And I think this is our opportunity to kick over some rocks and shine some light on some judging habits that we've seen that we don't think are great, even if there's things that like mm -hmm. I've done that I need to get better at as a judge. Um, are there any particular judging habits that you've seen in competitions that drive you nuts that really you'd like oh. to change or ethical things uh, with judges? Um, well, num you know, number one, if they're making sounds or faces as, you know, before we started discussing, although I have to admit, I've done it. I had some really terrible, terrible, like I, I basically spit it out into the glass. I couldn't help. It was a, you know, it was a reaction that I couldn't control. But, but beyond that, you know, the judge, the judges, as, as they shouldn't say, oh my gosh, this is so good. Or, oh my, you know, there, it should be total silence. And because you don't want to, um, you know, bias any of the other judges by how you feel that that's, that comes after that when you all have made up your independent, um, 
you know, assessment of the entry. So that's one thing that I, uh, um, that I, that I have a problem with. Um, the other, you know, some judges like they, they will only, you know, they will never like give a certain type of, uh, mead, like, you know, uh, you know, a good score. I've heard them say that, you know, the, a mead made with a certain ingredient. Oh, I will never give it a good score. That that's showing your bias. I mean, if, if you have that kind of bias against that ingredient, whatever it is, you really shouldn't be judging quite frankly. Um, so that's another peeve of me. Um, then when we're, when we're trying to decide which ones to, uh, to push forward, uh, you know, like maybe in the mini boss or whatnot, you know, when they're championing cer certain um, entries, and, and it's really frustrating because I might have an entry that I'm not trying to champion, but I'm trying to fight these my other ones. Oh, no, it has to be ours that we send. Um, and it's not, not even yours. It's someone's. We don't know who it is. But, you know, when they're really championing entries, and that's why I like when they have a whole different set of uh, judges, you know, judging the, the mini boss so that it's not like my entry that I'm pushing forward, but not your entry that we're pushing forward. Um, I think it should be just a whole second set of judges and the, and the competition that do that. I think it's a lot. It's a lot better. It definitely has seemed like a trend that's that's been happening a lot is having separate mini boss judges. So I mean, it seems like a very straightforward way to fight that tendency. Yeah, and if you think about it, you know, you've you've judged this entry deeply or these entries, and you've pushed them forward. Now you're here with some other judges deciding to go to, you know, you haven't analyzed theirs as well. So you're going to be more familiar with yours. So it's human nature again to want to push what you're more familiar with. And, and that's how you can have that champion, championing happening. Um, but you need to take a step back so that you don't do that. Uh, if you happen to have to you know, judge a mini boss with entries that you're familiar with and then some that you're not, you need to be aware of that bias and take a step back. And you know, am I pushing for this one because it is the, you know, really is one of the best or is it I'm just more familiar with it and I'm not as familiar with these other ones that are now showing up and we have to decide which ones to push forward. I'd like to take a minute to talk about score sheets. Uh, we're just coming off of uh, NHC results. And there's been some very uh, interesting discussions online about what people are receiving for feedback or not. But so this NHC competition aside, I'm not interested in talking about that specifically, but with score sheets in general, what does a good score sheet look like in terms of feedback and how much expectation should there be for judges to recommend or prescribe changes versus just describing the mead. Yeah, so, um, you know, the worst thing is like a completely empty uh, score sheet or one that has very little comments, you know, whether it was a good mead or a bad mead, you know, you need to let me know, you know, what was it that that made you decide to do that, to do that score. Now, I've had some really wonderful meads that, you know, they couldn't say much other than they really liked it. And that's wonderful, mm -hmm. you know, but um, when, when there's a, a, a score that's, that's pretty low, you know, I think it's really unfair to not justify why did you give that, you know, you know, and, and, and when giving feedback, just remember, you don't, you don't know the backstory. You didn't make this meet. I I've had judges say such silly things. Um, they just didn't know, you know, so don't be so sure of yourself. And I, and even myself as a judge, I'm, I'm sure I probably said things, you know, I try to be helpful um, but I also know that I don't know the whole backstory or, you know, what happens. So don't say that, you know, you did, you know, you fermented at too high of a temperature or something like that. Um, you know, because maybe I didn't, maybe it was another thing that caused the, that, that flaw or whatever that you picked out. Are most of those, uh, foibles, uh, that you're seeing from people assuming a process or are there other, th other trends that you're seeing where it, it kind of makes you cringe when you're looking at score sheets? Um, well, yeah, you know, um, you shouldn't have boiled your honey. I'm like, I never boil my honey. So, I mean, whatever, wherever that flavor you got came from, um, I think it was the honey varietal, actually, it was an unusual honey varietal. And so they just thought that the honey was caramelized, but it wasn't, it was just the way the honey varietal was. But, you know, you seem kind of silly when you say something like that, it, not really knowing what you're talking about. Um, I've also had judges say things that, um, you know, like I entered a meat into the, uh, like a mellow mel, you know, and, and they, and one of the judges said need spices. And I'm like, I would have made a fruit and spice then if that's what it needed, judge it for what it is. Don't tell me to, you know, if, if you think it should be a little sweeter or it should be like a little, a little more acid or tannin, that's fine. But don't tell me to just have an, have made a totally different entry that should have been in another category. Then I would have made it. And then you could have judged it in that category. So that, you know, that's another kind of silly, uh, 
comment that you know doesn't really mean anything so how do you how much do you think it's appropriate to take in uh the intent of an entrant when you're judging something uh like so it might not be fair to say you should have considered using spices because it's going to push in a different category but even you know i would prefer this a little sweeter is it fair to to take into account that maybe they're not going for something that's that sweet as long as we're sticking within the the dry semi-sweet sweet categories how fair is it to consider maybe they were just going for something that's yeah on that end well ex that's exactly right you know if it's not out of category you know if it's not out of style it's not out of category then um you shouldn't really put any, be putting um you know comments in like that you know judge what's in the glass you know it could be a a, a low semi-sweet or medium semi-sweet or you know higher but if it's still in category judge what's in the glass you know maybe that's what the what the uh, entrant was aiming for and um, is that example well made example of of that then then you, that's that's what you should judge you shouldn't say that they should have made something different again as, you know assuming it's still in category what about if uh, a slight tweak in sweetness would bring it into better balance is that a fair yeah that would be that's a little different you know it's so if it's a little bit you know out of balance then then you might make a comment like that you know like more acid or tan or tone down the sweetness a little bit or whatnot but that's more of a balance um, situation rather than telling them to make, you know, a totally different need. Sure. Uh, I feel like a lot of our um, discussion here is probably targeted toward not necessarily brand new mead judges, but people who have judged a bit. So when we're talking to this group of maybe intermediate judges, do you have any specific advice for intermediate judges on how to up their game or how to, how to get better at what they do? So I recommend traveling and going to some competitions out of your region. Um, there definitely is a thing called regional bias. Uh, you know, when I was entering, uh, you know, National Meme Maker of the Year, I would change up my entries depending on what part of the country that entry was getting sent to. And I would sweeten it up if I was sending it to some parts of the country, whereas I might have it a little bit less so in other places. So, you know, if, if you've been judging, but you really haven't left your city or your state, um get get out a good travel and i try to do that at least once a year that's that's kind of one of the goals the pandemic kind of put a stop to that a little bit but um i like to travel and you know go to one competition maybe a new competition that i haven't judged at before at least one per year that's you know and and, and you can meet different people and you can meet different needs too that are entered into that competition um, but it really is a problem it's like well i've been judging for you know whatever how many years but you only judge your one local competition and you know that's not a lot of experience because you may be getting the same type of things um over and over so um that's my biggest recommendation and then try to go to one of the bigger competitions you know like if you're an intermediate judge and you're trying to expand your knowledge you know try to go to Mazer cup or you know nhc or one of those if you if you can um I think it's assumed that we all have biases. Do you have any advice for how to identify and combat your own biases or blind spots? So, yeah, and I definitely have biases, and I, you know, I have aversions too, things that I maybe I don't like. And I think the best thing to do is to basically, um, you know, recognize them, you know, call them out. Uh, you know, for example, I, I am a sucker for a well-made cherry and buckwheat. I love that combination. But if there's a cherry buckwheat there, I'm like, okay. And there's other ones. I'm like, I don't, I'm not just picking this one because it's the cherry buckwheat. I'll, you know, this other one that's, you know, some other combination. I, I, I articulate it. You know, I, I even say, it, I tell the other judges, I'm like, you know, when we're discussing this, so, because I don't want to overscore it, you know, or, you know, give it, give it a higher score than it needs. So um, if we're, you know, discussing the entries and I seem to be out of line and my, I scored it a little bit too positively, I'm very willing to come down. You know, just being aware of it and articulating it to yourself um, and then even others as you're going through that discussion process, that could be really helpful. If you're verbalizing with your other judges and saying, I have a, a preference for this particular style or combination, do you think that's an appropriate discussion um, during your flight when you're like... No, no, no. At, at, afterwards, when you're deciding which to push forward, you know, after, at, you know. Okay. Yeah, but in yeah. that initial judging pair, those uh, conversations are appropriate, not just at mini boss. You feel comfortable discussing um, bias during a discussion. During when you're discussing first, I, I wouldn't mention that until you're, you know, they, they both you both have said, you know, what you thought, 
And then if you tend to, if you happen to be like the higher, like scorer for something that, you know, let's say you're, you have a, you have a, a preference for that. Um, or it could be in reverse too. You have an aversion towards something or whatever that is. And you happen to be way out of line lower um, compared to other judge, you know, then it's like, maybe you need to be the one that modifies your score in that situation, you know, more willing to modify your score. Uh, speaking of scores, what is your take on scoring ranges? Uh, it seems like some judges, especially some of the recent conversations I've seen uh, regarding competitions, some people want to throw out scores entirely and say this is just a, this is just a what's better and who wins. What do you think is the appropriate role of scoring? And it seems like some judges are really harsh. Some are very generous. Like, what do you think is an appropriate approach to scoring? Well, I, you know, I like I like scoring. It it gives a a number you know, for the, for the, uh, competitor to look at, um, you know, if you, if you, uh, enter this entry, say to a few different competitions and you're getting most of the scores are within that, you know, a, a fairly tight range, then, you know, that that's probably pretty accurate. Um, and then if one competition is like totally different then probably those judges are the ones that are, you know, that are less like, you know, maybe less, uh, um, you know, did, did a less, um, uh, good of an assessment of your entry. Um, I wouldn't like base how you think about your entry based on just one um, competition because there's so much variability in judges. You know, I've had entries that, you know, got perfect 50 in different competitions, um, never less than I think a 47 and one competition, it got a 32. I'm like, yeah, I think that it's probably in the high forties, at least most, but you know, that's probably where it belongs. Maybe not fifties, but you know, at least in the high forties. So I think scores are useful, but when it comes down to it, you know, when you're going to be, you know, which ones are going to win the medal, it, you know, you're not comparing which one had the best score to, you're, you're going to be tasting it and, and pushing the ones that, you know, I like it. I don't like it as much and I don't like it at all, you know, out of those mini bosses. So then you're not really scoring there. So I think scoring has a place, um, but also just deciding which is better also has a place. Um, it just kind of depends on where you are in the, you know, what, you know, where you are in the, in the competition at what round you're, you're uh, judging. Yeah, how often have you seen uh, comments online about my me got a forty eight and it didn't even place? Uh, it's it just when you that's just yeah that's just silly yeah I I don't even see like there shouldn't really even be a discussion about that because um, many times the one that got the medal actually had a lower score you know than the one that maybe didn't get a medal or got a lower medal because it's that's just the way it is and you're having different judges doing that also. Yeah, and I think it comes from just a, a lack of understanding of the way that competitions work. I think it's a lot of entrants that have never judged before, and they they think they're just lining up a list of, okay, these are the top scores, that's first, that's second, that's third, and not realizing that it's part of the initial process, and then once it reaches mini boss, it is just a purely comparative without scoring. So it's, exactly. I, I think it's just something not a lot of uh, people that haven't judged realize that that's the format. Exactly. I think we should taste some mead. What do you think? I think so. All right. We are going to judge some mead. Do you want to talk about what we have here, Tom? Well, it's Zen B Meadery Mara Ume. It's a plum mead with maraschino cherry. Um, and it's made um, out of Japanese plums. So it's going to be like a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, well, I mean, I don't know what it's going to be like, obviously. We're going to, we're going to tell, we're going to determine that here in a moment. The ABV is a uh, 6.5%. So it's a, definitely a session strength. And it contains sulfites. Um, it's right up your alley. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to walk us through how you would approach me to kind of your evaluation process here, Tom? So, you know, the first thing is, um, you know, right when you open it, uh, if it gushes out and goes all over the place, that, that would be a problem. Um, and then, uh, pouring into the glass, uh, you take a quick look at the appearance and then I very quickly take a sniff. And that's even before I'm ready to do the full assessment. And the reason is um, some of the my some of the flaws, if they're if they're fleeting, some of the reductive flaws can can go away pretty quickly. Um, you know, especially some of the sulfide flaws, they, they as soon as they hit oxygen and they just kind of go away. Uh, so you want to get that really fast. And then there's some of the real pleasant aromas too that can be very fleeting. Do you want to take a moment to explain reductivity and, and kind of how you, what that's like? You know, so there's two uh, general uh, 
ways of making wine or mead, and these are not really exclusionary, of course. Uh, you're really tr sort of one side of the, uh, you know, one side or the other. Um, so when I say reductive, that's basically means lack of oxygen. And so it's, it's fermented, uh, you know, with the, the, um, the headspace uh, is not gonna have oxygen, it's maybe gonna be purged with an inert gas. Um, you're gonna use sulfites early to capture any oxygen that happened to get in there to prevent oxidation. Generally, it's going to be fermented cool. Uh, and because you're basically trying to capture that essence of the fruit and the honey, that crisp, fresh, you know, like a snapshot, but but in, in aroma and flavor. Um, oxidative, that's going to be more, well, we talked about the Polish style means, of course, uh, but it doesn't have to be Polish style, you know, all, that's way, you know, towards that that sherry-like note. It could could even be something like a, a pyman or melomel that's high in tannins, that's barrel age, because you're having microoxygenation. Um, and so the faults that you see with, with reductive uh, styles uh, can be some of these sulfide flaws, you know, and, and one of the obvious ones is hydrogen sulfide. That's the one that really is obvious, but the one that we tend to see more often that's more uh, difficult to pick up is uh, DMS, dimethyl sulfide, because it doesn't really have that, that stink, you know, like the mercaptans or the hydrogen sulfide. It's more of an off when it's subtle, it's hard to explain. I, 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 I play in the reductive mead we're um, making most of the time. So I'm extremely sensitive to re reductive faults because I've made it, made those faults many, many times. And I'm so hypersensitive to it um, to get it out of there because if you don't, it's going to just take, there's going to be something there that you can't really pick up, but it's just something that it's not as good as it could be. That's the best way I can describe a really mild DMS fault. Um, Definitely so, not a fault that I hear about in mead discussions much more in beer. Yeah, no, I mean it, it happens in wine too, of course. So, you know, some of the the the, the high ass, you know, like so, some of these uh, white wines typically. Um, it's just like something is there that so that it's not as good as it could be. It's it doesn't really necessarily have that. I mean, again, hydrogen sulfide. Everybody can recognize rotten egg. Um, or captains, you know, give me some asphalt rubber, you know, rotten onion, whatever. Um, those are pretty obvious, but DMS, it, it's, it, it has a much milder, you know, some people describe it like cooked vegetable, you know, things like that, which, yeah, that's true. But it, 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 when it's at lower levels, it's hard to pick up. I'll just keep going since I interrupted you to make, <laughs> make you give your reductivity speech. <laughs> yeah. And so I would have already been uh, smelling and tasting this because some of the pleasant honey aromas and stuff could have already been, you know, and fruit aromas could have been coming out. How much of a swirler are you? I swear a little bit, but I don't want to swirl out of the glass on, on video. So, and I don't, this lovely carbonation too. So you're also looking at it too, you know, and uh, this is obviously carbonated, but let, if this entry had been entered, let's say in the still category, you would have made a comment of that. Uh, um, you know, if somebody has entered a still and, and it's, it has this much, you know, off gassing. So this is obviously a sparkling you have a good way to differentiate petalant from sparkling? Um, so this is my opinion, um, and I'm not sure if, if everybody agrees with that, but petalant, you can see the bubbles, but you don't really feel them. Like they're not like, you know, like carbonated, fully carbonated, that'd be like soda pop or a champagne, you know, where like it's almost foaming when it hits your mouth. Um, petalant, sometimes it can be like almost prickly, like, so there's like a few little bubbles you see, but they're not really, they're not like rising. Like, you know, this one's, you know, it's just, they're rising up and just, they're continuing to come up. Whereas with, it, with pedaline, it might almost be like you, you taste it and you can feel the dissolved carbon dioxide in your mouth, even though you don't see that many rising bubbles. So there's like a few little tiny bubbles, you know, forming and, you know, popping up here and there, but not like continuously uh, forming and forming these little lines of bubbles going up. Yeah, it's definitely, I noticed that in the last year for me when I was tasting meads, just some subtle carbonate, car, subtly carbonated meads and how much mouthfeel like you get from the once, because it's such a warm environment, right? Once it gets in your mouth and that dissolves CO2, yep, it's yep, yep. rush out of solution. Well, and you don't want to make a mead with zero dissolved CO2 either. They'll seem flat, even if it's a still mead. Hmm. Um, that's a problem too, is if you totally... Uh, remove all that you, you don't want to have enough to make it you know petalant or or carbonated but even um even a still will have a little bit of dissolved carbon dioxide still in it 
Um, it's a problem if you do a lot of processes, you know, say you're filtering and stuff where, you know, you get the CO2 all out of it. Um, you know, you might have a really flat uh, mead. On the other hand, you know, if you have a still mead and you're serving it in a keg and you're pushing it with CO2, but not much pressure, you could add more CO2 than you want. And, you know, then that might be fine if you want it to be pedaling or sparkling. But if you don't, then that could be an issue too. What do you think of the aroma on this one? You know, we were talking about subtlety and it, it, it is really nice. Um, you know, the the plum and the maraschino are there, but they're not like, you know, hit you in the face. Uh, you know, I'm getting some almond, which makes sense because that's what, you know, that's coming from the maraschino and some of the plums. I It's curious. I wonder what uh, you know, type of plums they use too to make this. I don't know. I think they said Japanese plum. So um, I can kind of picture that. I've had plenty of Japanese uh, plum wines, but again, I can't assume that I can't put my expectation in there when you're judging you're judging what's in the glass and so I don't know that for sure but for what I'm getting seems to be that type of uh you know I would I wouldn't be surprised if I found out it was one of those Japanese uh types of uh plums that was used or plum juice yeah it's such like bright very light ethereal fruit flavors it's like it reminds me of cotton candy um yeah like if you, if this was dialed up a couple more notches, I would be tempted to say artificial, but it, cause it's so like very light, high tone, you know. And, you know, maraschino cherries are, you know, we think of them as being artificial-ish anyway, you know, those true <laughs> food <laughs> color, come, you know, red food like coloring, <laughs> and, you know, and, and as kids, we'd, we'd go and eat them out of the jar and then get yelled at. Cause you know, it's like we, like they were like candy. So, you know, I mean, that's not, that's, that's not, not wrong. I mean, you know, there's the maraschino cherries in there. So are you one who does a lot of different, uh, like sniffing techniques? Are you like a couple of quick sniffs or you do a lot of deeper ones or you just, I just get it. I just, I just, I just, I just start, I don't do quick sniffs. And okay. I mean, I do try to do some of the retronasal, you will pick up things, you know, that, but yeah, no, I don't have any like, uh, you know, ritual of, of, uh, tasting. I just get, get into it and get it done. I recall a uh, uh, homebrew con uh, session that I got to sit in on in person. I think it was Baltimore, I want to say, and it was Gordon Strong giving a, a talk about how he evaluates. And I, I think it was about a 12 step sniffing process. <laughs> hey, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I do try to bring the glass up and then try to sniff from the top of the glass and the lower part, because sometimes you can have differences, you know, some of the different aroma compounds are more volatile and they may like be at different parts of the glass you know going as compared to putting your nose down deep in the glass versus sniffing around the edges you can get that there are it can be some differences but it's not like i have the, again i don't have a ritual of how i do it okay so you know i there's i'm not getting any uh any flaws um the the plum and the and the maraschino you know they're not like intense they, they're all but they're both there um I think it's really balanced well because, you know, if it was sweeter, um, you know, there's not, it, there's acid there, but it's not a huge amount of acid. Um, but if there was more sweetness, then it would be out of balance. So I think it's, they're actually perfectly paired. Um, the body is light, but that's what you would expect with a session mead. Um, it's very refreshing. I could, you know, see drinking this on a, on a summer evening, which is a summer evening, which is what we're ha having tonight. So you know, the color is, is beautiful. There's, it's, uh, it's brilliantly clear. I don't have my little light to see, but it's just so clear. The carbonation is still rising. So it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit more carbonated than some of the sessions, uh, commercial session strength meats that I've had before. Some of them really, you know, they're, they're supposedly carbonated, but they maybe were more towards the petalant <laughs> side, which, you know, neither here nor there, that's that, that they were, that there that's fine can we focus on color for a second i'm just picturing if you had a uh, a cherry mead in a flight and it comes out very pale is this something that you see as a negative if this was a judging scenario um no because i don't know how much cherry they used um unless they you know i don't know what type of cherry they used uh you know, so 
there are yellow cherries. Now, honestly, if I was entering this as a competitor, I would say it was a type of cherry that's yellow. So, you know, so the you know you got to lead the judges along. You know, there's ta there's tactics to to getting medals, and part of that you don't want to have the judge trying to figure out what what it is that they're tasting. So, you know, if I happen to use a, a you know a, a yellow or light colored cherry, then I would be making sure to make note of that on the list of ingredients. Um, you know, this is a, a, a plum mead and, and plums can be red or they can be, you know, purple or they can be yellow. So I don't know what type of plum it is. So the color, you know, for me doesn't mean anything because I just don't, I'm not going to, I'm judging what's in front of me rather than trying to assume, uh, you know, what ingredient it was that they used. Uh, now, what about fruit combinations? So if you were in a judging flight and you had two fruits, uh, like you had a melon melon with two fruits, who can have a pretty overlapping expression. Like for me, if, if I was to taste a similar meat and say, you know what, I can't really separate out the plum from the cherry. Should I be expected to, to be able to perceive these each very distinctly, or am I just looking for something that's harmonious? That's a really, um, that's a really good question. So, um, you know, I've heard judges say, oh, this is muddled. I can't detect the the, the different uh, berries, they say that a lot in berry meads and it's like, but they're very similar. How are you gonna like separate those out? It, I wouldn't call it muddle. I, I would say, is it like, like you said, is it harmonious? Um, you know, it, it's, it's sort of like in music where there's a chord, you play whatever chord you're playing. You might not hear the individual notes. They're all being played at the same time, but how does that chord sound together? Is that, a, is that the chord you want? Is that a pleasant chord? then that's good. You're not, you don't, you're not going to detect every single one of those. Um, now, if you're playing around with flavors that are very, very different, you know, fruit and spice is a perfect example, you know, then you, you better, you know, I, I made an orange rosemary. Well, you better be able to detect both of those. Um, you know, if you're entering that into a competition, um, but yeah, between a cherry and, and a plum are very similar, you know, they're stone fruit. There's a lot of overlap. That's why it's a very good combination to, because, it's like you're adding complexity by using these different fruits. You're adding complexity that would not have been there had you used just one or the other by itself. Again, making a chord in your glass, something that's harmonious, bringing, making it to something that neither of those by themselves would be like. I feel, I am really interested by your fruit and spice comparison because never, I've never heard it, heard it put like that. And that's a really good way. If, it's, if we're talking about ingredients that are very different, they should be able to be perceived as obviously different in your glass versus something that they're similar exactly. if they're not distinct. And neither is, is the better way and neither is the wrong way. It's just, what are you trying to do? Um, you know, I play around with this in flavor in my cooking, but you know, when I'm creating a meat or even before I create it, when I'm thinking about it, I try to think about these flavors that I might use. Some might enhance each other, some might contrast. And sometimes contrast is good. It's, it makes it interesting. Now it, it could be a contrast that's clashing and that's not good. That, that would be a way for a mead to be out of balance also. It's just simply the flavors don't play well. Um, you know, if you use flavors that don't play well together, then that's, that's another form of being out of balance, you know, in flavor, you know, not the way we think of, you know, with acid, tan and sweet and all of that. Um, but sometimes you use, use ones that are very similar. So you can get that, that harmonious, like I said, that, that just all of them blended together that, that can taste something, you know, better than they would be individually by themselves. They would be less, less interesting, less complex by themselves. Hmm. Awesome. Can you walk me through your evaluation of structure? on a mead like this? So with a session strength, you know, it's very tempting to, um, especially if it's not separated out by itself when it's in a flight of, of multiple, um, you know, multiple strengths, you have to be very careful because it might seem kind of thin and watery, but it, it's not, it, it has plenty of flavor. Um, it's just not going to have as much, say, viscosity or mouthfeel because it doesn't have the alcohol to do that. Um, the carbonation it, um, is, is helping, of course, but it, it's not fair if this was being judged among a flight and, you know, you had a sack strength and a standard strength on each side. I mean, this one would compare to those, you, you know, as a judge, you might be biased and say that it's thin and watery when it isn't not. It's, it's not at all. It's a perfect example of, you know, what you would expect for a session strength meet. So that goes back to judging what's in the glass and trying to not judge what you want it to be or be biased by what you just you know tasted a few minutes earlier 
Um, and so as, as I taste it, you know, the carbonation um, is foaming in my mouth and I can feel that. And yeah, it's not a, it's not a viscous or heavy mead, but it shouldn't be. I mean, I would, I would be, if it was, then it would be out of, you know, it wouldn't be a session strength mead. It would be something else. Really the tannins are very minimal. Um, most of the, you know, the, the, the drying that comes at the end of, at the finish is really from the, the acid. Um, it's, I wouldn't call it a high acid. I mean, there's, there's acid there, but it's not, not high acid, but it, there's just enough for what you need. Yeah. I'd say moderate and kind of buoyed by that carbonation. Mm -hmm. Um, is there much of a role in your opinion for tannin and a style like this? Uh, yeah, I, I tend to use, um, I tend to use tannins early on. Uh, it's not so much for adding. So tannins are complicated. You know, we think of tannins for flavor, but they actually do a lot more. So using it early on in fermentation, they can be uh, protective. They can help prevent um, oxidation even before you have any sulfites on board. Um, so like a product, uh, and there's many of them, but like FT Blanc is a, is a good one. That, that would be a, a tannin that I would put into this, maybe even was put into it. But a lot of those are, are gone, you know, at, at the end of alcoholic fermentation, a lot of those are settled out. Um, I think I heard a, a enologist call them sacrificial tannins. So you're putting them in um, early on in your fermentation to protect it, you know, prevent it browning and prevent oxidation, uh, you know, without having a lot left afterwards. Um, you can use FD Blanc, uh, and, and I'm not necessarily recommending that uh, brand name. There's other ones also. Uh, but some of these tannins you can use even afterwards and they don't necessarily add astringency like we expect. Um, some of them can actually add almost a sensation of sweetness, even though they're not a sugar. Yeah, I've seen that uh, been a comment with, I think, FD Blanc or FD Blanc Soft, where we're talking about, say, dry trads, that that's a way to import some sweetness. Mm -hmm. Sweet impression, at least. Yeah. yeah. Um, any other comments on this particular example? It's just a delightful mead, you know, it's not, it's, it's a, it is what it says it is, you know, what, what they said that it is. And, um, I'm getting the plum, the maraschino. I don't know what type of honey they used, but I mean, there's, there's honey in there. Um, it's pleasing to drink, you know, even just when you get to the overall impression too, you know, is, is this something that if I could have, you know, I didn't have to judge anymore today, would I have another glass, you know, or would I finish the bottle? And yeah, I mean, I got the bottle right there and my wife's not home yet. So I don't know. I, I, I should probably save some for her, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think it's great. It's really light, refreshing, ethereal. Um, like it's got like a, it's not super sweet, but it's got a real confectionery kind of impression because these fruits are so, so really ethereal. It's kind of neat. Yeah. Well, cheers. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Cheers to you. Thanks. Any final or closing comments you want to make? Um, you know, like I had said, you know, it's just judge the mead that is in the glass in front of you. Um, try not to think too much about what the mead maker was doing because you don't know the backstory. Um, you know, maybe you might have done it differently, but they made it, made what they made and, and, uh, and they had their reasons for it. And so you, as a judge, it's your duty to be as objective as you can knowing that we all are all subject, subjective and we all have biases and, and, and we have to rise above that. And so it's just by recognizing whatever those biases are and then uh, you know, basically articulating with yourself so that you will call them out and you'll be, you'll be able to hopefully um, you know, counteract that yourself by uh, whatever it is, a preference or an aversion. Um, and then taste a lot of mead and, and do it mindfully, you know, whether it's in competition or if you're traveling and you see, see a bottle of a brand you've never seen in the store, try that. Um, you know, just try a lot of different types of mead so you can get just a, a feel for all the different many ways there are to make mead. Wonderful. Yeah, and get out of our get out of our own individual hobbit holes, right? Travel exactly. Try to exactly. Cheers. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for thanks for your time, Tom, and thanks for sharing your knowledge. Well, thank you. Cheers. Cheers.